yes, yes. So we have what? I am at um, uh, the we're university we're LCC. And we're going to start um, recording for this whole thing. We'll try to catch it on here. Just want to let y'all know. And um, as you see, I have no mic. <laughs> we try to keep it as quiet as we can because there's different things going around with us and below us. So. And I do these sort of things all the time. And you know, that's okay because before there was mics, there were always e voice. <laughs> So yeah, as you can see, I guess you can see the background now. Uh, Are we going to be a, go to a speech after this? And it has to do with... Judaism, African? Yeah. Judaism and African. And we, we have some other stuff we'll do. So this is the beginning of some more show we'll do on the road. So I'll play some few songs, three or four songs. And um, Eric will take it over from there. So I'm going to do one of my songs called um, Ready to Dance. Tonight, 
you make her feel alright. Lovers in the house tonight, we make her feel so fine. Lovers in the house tonight, I feel alright. Oh yeah. I wash up the house in a dance all style. Mash up the house in a roots man style. Some of them are chant, he says some of them are laugh. Some of them are God, them are do it all right. Them are mash up the house, them are mash up the house. Them are mash up the house in a dance all style. Tra la la, la la la. one is a song I am um, going to put it in a little, uh, put it in a little reggae ska and it's a song older folks should remember the song. I think it's done by the Kingsman but originally done in the Caribbean. We did it first. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to do it in instrumental. It's called Snoop John B. So I call it Rasta John B. <laughs> and it's, it's an instrumental song but I'm going to try it for you guys. Song you want to try it song. Actually, I write the song, you know, 
it has to do with my mother and my stepfather. You know, in the, mod, my, my, in the Caribbean, my um, stepfather used to work for the government, for the street, for public work, called the Public Work Department, Lincoln. And um, those days were necessarily depends on clock to wake you up. This is way back in the 70s or something like that. And um, he will use the rooster to crow. And in the morning, I saw all this hurry. Then my mother, hurry up, hurry up. He said, I got to get to work. I don't want to be late. She's fixing food, right? <laughs> hurry up. And he said, listen to the rooster. I'm going to be late. Because the rooster, there's a time that they stop. And I always tell myself, you know, I want to stay if when I be a musician. Carlos wanted to play guitar and things like that. I said, I want to write a song about that. But I don't know if I, you know, I don't necessarily know if I could, but it just a thought as a kid, you know. So I did live up to that. <laughs> right. I write a song, but this actually this is like the first time I am. Um, I record it, but this is the first time I'm singing it in the public. My mother passed away, but it's all cool now, you know, I feel good about it. So it's, it's a Caribbean song, and some of my, um, some of my, um, let's say, people that I admire is like Harry Balafonte and uh, some guys like Lord Kitchen and Midas Sparrow, you guys might not be familiar with, but most people are familiar with Harry Balafonte. So I try to keep it in that Calypso, it's Calypso, so I'm trying to keep it in that. In that, and you know, I want to stray so much, so that's the style I write it into. So let's let's give it a try. It's called Gwendolyn. <laughs> Yeah. 
getting late and I just can't wait to come home from work. So Eric will be up and um We need help with I will sit and listen to him also myself. Okay. Hey, where's Tatiana anyhow? <laughs> this girl got all this stuff together and then not in here. So good, I got her now. Yeah, you did. She'll be back. Yeah, sure. All right, well, um, are we ready to go? Everybody's here? Thank you all for coming. You know, I'd like to thank the uh, Jewish Student Union for putting this event on and inviting uh, the Black Student Union to participate with you all for this event. Uh, my name is Eric Richardson. I'm a member of the Lane Community College Black Student Union and also just a student of history and a lover of the mysteries of life. And uh, when I was approached by the JSU to give a presentation about the uh, relationship between Africa and Judaism, uh, I was thrilled because that's something I, I'm I really uh, an end to, especially ancient Africa, and, and when you talk about ancient Africa, you're, always, you're gonna have this intersection between Judaism and other religions that came through and out of Africa. So today I just wanted to uh, also thank Evan Belize for coming out and playing, giving us that music, and I thought it was very appropriate because today's uh, uh, presentation is gonna be coming from the point of view of an African. American, and which I, I, I am, Evan Belize, comes from Belize, <laughs> you know, hence his name. Uh, but so we represent part of the 60 million Africans who were taken from the African continent and brought forceful, forcefully to the Americas. Uh, when that happened, not only uh, were we stripped from our, our, our continent from whence we came, but we are stripped from our nations, from our families, sometimes from our language and our histories. And so this is uh, where I begin my presentation. Can you go ahead and hit the lights, Ron? So I'm gonna begin the presentation with just an explanation of, of my background and as an African American. As you see, we come from humble beginnings here in America. Slavery lasted for over 300 years in America. Um, and I'm counting that from the beginnings of the uh, slavery in the 1500s that occurred under the Spanish and, and continued through the English and the other people who came through the New World. Um, and I, I, I said it was forced labor and unspeakable terror. This is not a slavery, a kind slavery. This is not something where where, uh, where you could put a, a gentle face on it. The slavery that existed in the New World was, was one of very uh, hostile and uh, brutal regime. And, and the 300 years of, of forced labor and terror is, is still with us today in the psychology that we all deal with. Um, and so the, the fact that over those 300 years, the blacks in the, of the New World, being North, Central, and South America, were isolated from the blacks of the Old World, being Africa, Europe, and Asia, the Pacific Islands. Because uh, one of the uh, uh, least understood aspects of black culture is, that, uh, is how far spread it is. You can find blacks all throughout the world from antiquity. And so, and this speaks to the ancient nature of the culture. So academic persecution and whitewashing of the history books has been taking place since the first blacks arrived in the 1500s. One of the, one of the ways that they could justify the, the act of slavery was to dehumanize the African. And to, in order to do that, they had to whitewash his image out of the history books. They had to change the image of the African from one of a civilized component of a, a civilization to one of being outside of civilization. And this really did take place during the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Uh, 
So, and the, uh, my next one is the dogmatic certitude of white supremacy. For the last 300 years, we have been told that the white race was the, the ultimate race, was the supreme race. And, that, and this came to its head during the Second World War with the regime of the Nazis in Germany. They, they took it to its uh, logical conclusion, which was extermination of other people like the, unlike themselves. So this dogmatic certitude is something that has kept black people and others down historically. And so all these things have led to an uphill battle for Africans in the Americas. So one of the things I like to talk about is that, yes, so slavery ended in America almost 160 years ago. But at that time, what was it that the African had other than his memory, other than the stories, the oral traditions that had been passed down through hopefully their intact families. But we have to realize a lot of times a, a slave family would be broken apart. So the stories that could have been told weren't told. And so at the end of slavery, we have to come out of slavery. And so this is why I named this Up From Slavery. And I have three prominent black men of the early 20th century who helped to send a message and a, a direction for academic study to find and recapture the image of black people in the world. Because at that time, at the end of, the, of, the, uh, of, of slavery in America, uh, the image of the black man was still one of a barbarian and non-civilized person. And so the first of these three people you may recognize is Marcus Garvey. And, uh, and that goes, it pertains to the music that you heard Evan sing. He's singing from the heart, he's singing from the islands, and he's singing about identity. And Marcus Garvey was one of the first people of the 20th century to really start to, to say we need to be a, a black people and we need to have our black identity. And his quote here is, we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because while others might, be, might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. You might recognize that from a Bob Marley song, but it's actually a quote from Marcus Garvey. And, and so the next person here is Leonard Powell. Most people probably don't know who Leonard Powell is, but Leonard Powell is a Jamaican who fought for the British in World War I. And this is one of the things that happened, I call them the Black Scrappers, right here. Oops, excuse me. There we go. <laughs> the Black Scrappers who led the way into the future. And basically, I call them scrappers because at, in the 20th, early 20th centuries, during the World War I, we had, for the first time, African men and women able to travel the world freely. And most of the times, it was as, as servants in the military. But they traveled the world during World War I, saw the world firsthand, and came back to the Americas with this new knowledge of what the world was about. And not only did they see firsthand, but they were scrappers. So whenever they would see a magazine article in the National Geographic or any kind of book that dealt with African identity, they would take that and they would end up having scrapbooks. You know? And this is how the, 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 we began to get on the way of academic, uh, the academic uh, path way to finding who we are after slavery. And so it's men like Leonard Powell. He came back after World War II, and he had been to Africa, uh, World War I, excuse me, he had been to Africa and to Europe, and he had read about the, uh, the Ethiopian nation that had n never been colonized by, by a, a, a European colonizer. He read about Menelik, and, and he was one of the first people to, to to put a divine nature on the house of Haile Selassie in Ethiopia, he brought back to the to the idea to the uh, Jamaica the idea of a holy black land under the under the uh, guise of the Coptic Church in Ethiopia. And so, how is the first to establish? He established a farm in Jamaica called the Pinnacle, and it was on this farm that the the cultivation of marijuana began to take place and also the cultivation of the Rastafarian identity took place on, the, on this farm that uh, Leonard Powell established. And he, he was persecuted uh, throughout the 40s and the 50s 
And by the 70s is when you have Bob Marley to uh, uh, come onto the scene. But Bob Marley and all the people who became Rastafari were actually students of Leonard Powell and his version of, of, of black nationalism. And so, and lastly is uh, Carter G. Woodson, who is the, uh, he created in the 1920s uh, the first Black History Week, which eventually became Black History Month, of which we celebrate today. He was an advocate for for uh, education for blacks coming out of slavery, and he and he also was an avid historian himself. And so these these three men really led the way in America for black self identity and searching. And so so uh, I just like to recognize that this is a, a new field of study of researching the black man and woman in a antiquity. So. For most of the uh, 19th and 20th century, racism posed as science. You know, you would have racists telling us that the Africans were were no were, were closer to apes than human, and are that whites were the epitome of uh, of the uh, of what God meant when He created man and women. And so we have we have these science uh, uh, racism posing as science. But with the, with the advent of the methodical scientific uh, uh, research, uh, we begin to crack and challenge some of those racist views. And, and one of the main uh, cracks came with, with the discovery in the 1930s of our African roots uh, by Lewis and Mary Leakey. And what they did is in Ethiopia, they found a 3.5 million year old uh, hominid remains, within, and it's a hominid in that it's bipedal. And so the, the history of humanity is, is the history of, of, of searching uh, from the time when our, when our ancestors may have been uh, uh, more ape-like to the point they became bipedal, to the point that their brain grew. This is evolution, you know? So I, I as an African scholar and African student, understand that, that uh, not everyone's going to agree with evolution and the science of evolution. But from what I have heard, the science of evolution is really agrees with the text, with the history, with the books. And so Ethiopia becomes the, initially the homeland of all mankind. And, it's in, in, and Lewis and Mary Leakey basically their finds established the idea of the monogenetic origins of mankind, meaning that all men on the planet originate from one genetic pool, and not as some racists have, have said in the past, that white people originated in Europe, blacks originated in Sub-Saharan, Asians originated there, and they were separate. And they never had relations. But the science is telling us that no, modern man originated in Africa and spread out. And through time, yes, those, those pockets of, of uh, the European, the Asian, and the African, and the Pacific Islands, yes, they did become distinct through time and through environmental uh, reasons. And so I move on from that. So finding black Africa. So as you, as you, as you start to look more into the, the, the history books, you start to look at European scholars, and I'm going to talk about two main European scholars, Godfrey Higgins, who was born in 1772, died in 1833, and Count Vonnet, who's a Frenchman who, who died in 1820. And both of these are very, you think, well, these are super arcane, old uh, uh, authors. But what it is is that this is going to the point that, that racism, at some point, increased. So the, the, as, as the African presence in the Americas and in the New World increased, the racism against them increased, and the academic racism increased. And so to the point someone like Count Vonnet, who is a, who's a, a well-known European philosopher and an artist, he wrote a book called Ruins of Empire, which he quoted here. Uh, 
those piles of ruins which you see in that narrow valley watered by the Nile are the remains of opulent cities, the pride of the ancient kingdom of Ethiopia. There are people now forgotten, discovered why others were yet barbarians, the elements of the arts and sciences. A race of men now rejected from society for their sable skin and frizzled hair, founded on the studies of law, those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe. This is a European white man in 1820. And, and, and so this tells you the, the, the opposition that has been there for black people to gain and to their respect and, and their place in history. There's a great opposition to that. And so when a European man such as himself stands up and, and proclaims that, he is persecuted himself. Um, God, Godfrey Higgins is another one. He wrote a book called Egypt, the Light of the World, which is another that, that just sheds light on the antiquity of ancient Egypt. And then Chikyat the Diop is a modern African scholar who led the way in, in pointing to the African uh, component of ancient Egypt. And I'm just going to read from here. He was a historian, anthropologist, a physicist, and a politician who studied the human race's origins and pre-colonial Africa. He was regarded as an important figure in the development of the Afrocentric viewpoint, in particular for his theory that the ancient Egyptians were, in fact, black Africans. Sheikh Anta Diop University in Dakar, Senegal is named after him. So after slavery ended, the, the, the most ample uh, place for a slave or a person studying their history was the Bible. That was the most op uh, uh, available text, and that was you know, oftentimes the only text available. And so the Bible was an entry point to the past for many uh, Africans in the New World. Uh, often the first and only book for blacks in America, entryway to understand the path, and, and, uh, and whatnot. And I'd like to talk about uh, this right now. Uh, so the Rastafari movement was, was, like a, was de developed by Powell. And, and, what, and why he was doing that, he was looking to place the African in the text, and looking to place himself in the text. And by doing that, they saw the links between Solomon and Sheba, the Queen of Sheba. They saw these links between Ethiopia and, and the ancients being both uh, Abraham and Moses. And so there's always there's these links with Ethiopia. And so they sought to apply that, that, that uh, formula to themselves. And, and, and also, at the same time, another group of Africans from the Americans who did the similar practice was the black Hebrew Israelites. Now these are, 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 must be uh, set, uh, defined as not being part of the philosophy from Ethiopia. We're not talking about Ethiopians. When I talk about the black Hebrew Israelites, I'm talking about African Americans who through their study of history identified themselves with the Hebrews of the Bible, with the ancient Israelites. And, be, and because of that, they decided to to become Hebrew, you know, in the ghettos of, of Chicago, in Detroit, in St. Louis. And so these black Americans in the 1960s actually immigrated to Israel. And so today we have, uh, there's at least 10,000 uh, people in Israel who call themselves black Hebrew Israelites. But, and they adhere to the law, and they dress according to their law, but they dress differently, and they look different than the Falasha, or the Falasha Mora, or even the Orthodox Jews of the day. They, in 1980, the state of Israel made a statement that, that, that said they do not recognize them as official Jews. Even though they are citizens of the state of Israel, the state of Israel does not recognize black Hebrew Israelites as real Jews. So that's just something. I don't know why, because you can convert to Judaism, which they did. But they, they're, they have a philosophy that goes along with it that puts them at a, as a descendant of Solomon, as a descendant of Queen Sheba. So that is outside of the norm of Judaism in Israel, as practiced in Israel. 
So, Ethiopia, where time begins. And, uh, and the reason why I did that is when you open the Bible, Genesis, the first two chapters of Genesis, we have this. The, the name of the second river, they're describing the Garden of Eden. The name of the second river it, uh, is Gihon. It flows around the whole country of Gut, Cush. So right away, as, a, as this fresh new mind trying to discover ourselves in the Bible, we understand that within the first, Bible, uh, first book of the Bible, that the, the ancient African country of Cush is mentioned. And that automatically puts an African identity in the very beginnings of, of the Bible. And uh, I have another quote here from Josephus, who is a Jewish scholar from the second century AD, who lived in Rome. And he gives an account of the nation of Cush, the son of Ham and grandson of Noah. And this is his quote. For of the four sons of Ham, time has not hurt at all the name of Cush. For the Ethiopians over he, whom he reigned are even to this day, both by themselves and by all men in Asia, called Cushites. So he was acknowledging that at the second century BC, or AD, that people in Persia, the Assyrians, everybody referred to the Ethiopians as Cushites. So there, there was an acknowledgement that the blacks in Ethiopia were the Cushites. And so, and then I have another quote here from, that this is, this is about Zipporah, who is the wife of Moses. And it says, and she's talking about this, stranger, this land is called Libya, an ancient name for the African continent. It is inhabited by tribes of various people, Ethiopians, dark men, one man in this place, is the ruler of the land. He is both king and general. He rules the state, judges the people, and his priests. This man is my father, Jethro. So, and then I'll get back to that later, but that's a very important part, that Jethro is the, is, is, is the father of his wife, and that is where he went when he left after Moses was accused of murdering an Egyptian. He fled Egypt and went to Midian, where he met Zipporah. But the idea is that, according to this and others, uh, Midian is not north of Egypt, is that he actually went south and went to Ethiopia. And so, so Jethro and his wife are Ethiopians. So this is something that, that we'll talk about later. So the word Ethiopia appears in the King James Version of the Bible. I say that because that's the main English version of the Bible that people read. Um, 45 times. So they're, they're, it's referred to 45 times. And another word that's referred to is the most common word in the Bible, period, is the word Egypt. And so that's very curious that Egypt and Ethiopia are so prominent in the Bible. And so now uh, I'm going to go into uh, the relationships that I've found in my studies. So Africa, basically, right now, according to most books, is uh, 700 million black folks. And, and, I, and, and, and I say this, I want to talk about the racism that still exists. Because that 700 million black folks excludes about 500 million Africans who they do not want to consider as black. Although, they may look like me. They may be a light-skinned black. But instead of saying that these are blacks, they say they're Middle Eastern or Arab. And so this, this uh, number, 700 million blacks, is sub-Saharan Africa. It doesn't include Egypt. It doesn't include Tunisia. It doesn't include Algeria. It doesn't include Morocco. But for sure, over half of the population in those countries are black. And so that is part of the racism that we still view here. It's called separate it and divide. And so, but anyway, Unfortunately, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the life expectancy is one of the lowest in the world, from anywhere from 35 to 49 years old. Uh, it depends on which country you're talking about. It's higher in South Africa and, and, uh, and other more industrialized nations. But it was pre previously referred to as the Dark Continent, but also uh, we talked about before as the place, birthplace of humanity and the cradle of Western civilization, which is something I won't touch on much today but we'll, we'll just keep going. So um, Judaism, as we know it today, uh, there's 14 adherents. When I say adherents, I mean people who actually practice the faith regularly, uh, worldwide. 
and it's one of the it, it is the oldest of the three major Western religion being Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, both the book of the Old Testament of the Tanakh is actually the book that the Christians and Islam use as their reference. So Islam, Christianity don't exist without Judaism. So the story of the Jewish people is an inspirational story of survival and self-identity. And in a lot of ways, there's, there's relationship between the story of, of survival and self-identity of the Jewish people and the survival and self-identity of the newly freed Africans in the Americas. And because of that relationship, there's, 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 synergy, there's something happening there. Okay, finding blacks in ancient time. And I use this, this is Queen Ty, 1500 BCE. And this is, is very interesting because this is almost contemporary with Abraham. Abraham, even though uh, most people say Abraham was about 1300 BCE. But Mo, uh, she is the mother of Amenhotep IV, who is otherwise known as uh, Akhenaten. And it's very curious that uh, any dictionary you get, and you look up the word monotheism, most people would think they would see you would see the word they, you would see Moses as the father of monotheism, but in fact, any dictionary you look up, they're going to say Akhenaten is the father of monotheism, because Akhenaten was the one who who worshipped the Aten, the sun disk, as the one god, and he overthrew the priesthood of ancient Egypt for a matter of 17 years, and this, and told them. All their ways was not the way of his religion. His religion was a new religion. He built a new city, Armana. And that's a whole part of history that is a mystery. And, that, and it's a mystery because it's so much related to the Exodus story and to the story of Moses. So the story of Akhenaten and the story of Moses uh, has been one of, the, one of our famous European scholars, Sigmund Freud, wrote a book called Moses or Monotheism in which he proposed that, in fact, Moses and Akhenaten were the same person. I'm not going to go into that, but that is something that, that we can look into. And in fact, uh, if that's true, we know that Akhenaten's mother, right here, she looked like a 1960s soul sister to me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's Akhenaten's mother, Queen uh, Tutankhamun's grandmother. So. Egypt's, Ethiopia's eldest daughter. Now I say that because that's what the Ethiopians say about Egypt. They say that Egypt was nothing but a, but a sandbar that got filled in from the, from the mud of Ethiopia flowing down the Nile and filled in that region and became Egypt. And so they, their history, their oral history is much older than ancient Egypt. But the, the, the reality of ancient Egypt is something that we need to, in modern times, get our head around. Because the length of time that we're talking about is not really readily acknowledged. So my first assertion here is that Egypt is the culmination of at least 26,000 years of African astrological consciousness. Now, what does that mean? That means that people in Africa for 26,000 years prior to the construction of the pyramid were astrologically conscious. They were looking at the stars. They were, they were making stories about the movements of the stars. They were plotting our, our time increments by the movements of the stars. The first calendars were set up by the observant observations of the stars. So by the time that the first pyramid is complete, we know that the, the calendar that the ancient Egyptians used was, had one great year, the solar year. And the solar year would, took place over 26,000 years. And how we know that is that they left testimony in the temple of Dendera in the Valley of the Kings. And, the, and that, is the, that is the temple that Queen Hatshepsut and the 18th dynasty, she left. And, and that is the oldest zodiac in the world is in that temple. But what we know is that they, they, they looked at the age of the, uh, of the uh, sun and ages. 
and they and they had the zodiac, and it's called the Great Procession. That one age took approximately a thousand three hundred years, right? And so to go through the zodiac, which is twelve signs, gives us this twenty-six thousand year period. So they were had the, the, the calendar in use at the time of the pyramid being completed. So just do the math. For them to have known it, it had to have gone through it once. And you'd think they may have had to gone through it twice. But then the fact that they wrote it down at this time. And so the history of mankind is older than we allow in the West. And that we know that Homo sapiens sapien modern man has been modern this way, dreaming, speaking, the same way you and I do for at least 150,000 years. So that means the time that we have in ancient times far outweighs the time since the time of Christ or even since the time of the pyramids. You know, so this is modern, the, the pyramids of modern time. So we have to understand the length of time that we're talking about. Um, okay. So, okay, now, and this is another thing that we have to really talk about, because a lot of people can get the confusion that, like, oh, well, uh, didn't the Jews build the pyramids? Weren't they slaves and built the pyramids? And that is a point, but it's not the timeline is, is wrong for them having built the pyramids. They did build cities, and, and according to the Bible, and they built temples. But the pyramid itself is, is, is so unique because it, it it was constructed at the very beginning of Egyptian civilization. Egyptian civilization lasted for 3,000 years. Within the first 500 years, all the great pyramids that you know of were built. So, this pyramid complex, the great three great pyramids in Saqqara, all took place in the first five dynasties. There were 33 dynasties in ancient Egypt. Within the first five dynasties, all of everything we know of ancient Egypt was intact. At the birth of Abraham, the father of Judaism, the pyramids and the text within the pyramids were already more than 1,000 years old. So, I mean, and it's, get a grip on that. What does that mean? And the Ethiopians say that Egypt wasn't there. And they saw the land filled in with mud, and then the pyramids were built, and then a thousand years later, Abraham comes. So the, the, the ancient idea of how old Ethiopia is, you need to really think about that. And so throughout the written history, Egypt and Ethiopia are, are viewed as rivals. You know, so when you like read ancient Egypt, they always talk about the Ethiopians as being East Gum, or you know, the North, the, the Southern you know, barbarians or whatever. So they were always rivals, even though when you read the text, they were similar in their, in their beliefs and their customs. Okay, and according to the Ethiopians, the Egyptians come from them. Toward the end of the Egyptian civilization, it was Ethiopia that revived the Old Kingdom beliefs. And the Old Kingdom are the first five dynasties. So all the beliefs that, are, that were established at the beginning of Egypt this 25th dynasty revived all those things, and it happened to be an Ethiopian black dynasty. Uh, okay, and then this is a really great book. I like anybody who want to look into this subject to check it out. This, the, the, the author's name is Henry T. Auburn, Auburn, and it's called The Rescue of Jerusalem. And it talks about the 25th dynasty. Um, uh, so there is disagreement among historians as to how many of ancient's 31 dynasties, he says 31, 32, I say, uh, were black. But all scholars agree on one thing. At least one of these dynasties was black, and that's the 25th dynasty. And it was this dynasty which ruled for about 75 years that sent an army to Jerusalem. Now, what this book talks about is that is, there is an event in the Bible called the Deliverance. And, uh, and it happens about 700 BCE. And the Assyrian army had basically uh, uh, wiped out all the cities of Samaria, right? And it was coming to the gates of Jerusalem. And, and that night, uh, according to scripture and according to beliefs, there, uh, prior, to, prior to the army getting there, there's a, a scripture, right? I, I should have wrote it down, but there's a scripture that says that 
look, the Nubians are sending the army. There's a, you know, then they say the king of the 25th dynasty by his name, Taharqa, and he, this is in the Bible. And so he is written in the Bible. And they say they're sending an army to rescue us. But then what happens next is that, according to Scripture, is the next morning, the, the residents of Jerusalem wake up and all the Syrian army is just dead. And it's called a miracle. And, but the army is never mentioned again, the army that was on its way. And so, so this book is, is, is uh, uh, propositioning that, that indeed Jerusalem was saved in the year 701 by a, a, a friendly Nubian army. And so my question is, what is that connection? that drives this African black uh, uh, Nubian pharaoh to go and rescue Jerusalem. And, and my contention is that there is a, a deep relationship between the blacks of Nubia and Jerusalem. Okay, and, that's a, and one of the ways we, we look into that relationship is looking at the language group. Ham, the son of Noah and Canaan, his ancestry, and the Afro-Asiatic language group. Now, a lot of people don't know about the Afro-Asiatic language group because it is, is a, a language group that is just now beginning to, to gain uh, legitimacy in, its, in research, you know. Uh, and what we're finding is Hebrew itself, the language of the, of the people of the Bible, is a dialect of the Canaanite language. And the Canaanite language is part of the, the Afro-Asiatic language groups. And ancient Egyptian, ancient Coptic languages are, are some of the eldest members of the Afro-Asiatic language group and are presumed to be the source of the language group. So, and then according to the Bible, Ham represents the people of Africa in the story of Noah and his three sons. Uh, and so Canaan has been historically associated with the Egyptian presence from Egypt in that land. They, they were basically vassals of the Egyptians, the Canaanite people. And so that brings me to, to Abraham himself, the father of the Judaism. A covenant was made, and this is the beginning of the nation of Israel. But some say uh, it's not actually until Jacob is named Israel by by. Uh, God, Jehovah. But um, how the nation of Israel began, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, will Almighty walk before me and be blameless. I confirm my covenant between you and me, and you will greatly increase your numbers. Now this is my point. Abram, A-B-R-A-M, fell down, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer you be called Abram, but your name will be Abraham. Uh, I'm not a scholar of biblical uh, research, but I've always wondered about that. His name has the, the, the suffix Ham on it. We know that Ham is related to Africa through Noah. So why is he now no longer Abram, but he's Abraham? Uh, it's interesting. I'm asking a question. I'm not making an assertion. Uh, for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruit, fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come for you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between you and your descendants after you for generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, which is interesting, because we were just talking about Canaan and Ham representing the African and Egyptian influence. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, Will give, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants, and I will be their God. So somehow, their God himself is putting this African identity on Abraham. He has to change his name, and then he put him in a place that is influenced deeply by that African. So this is very interesting again. Okay, um, so now I go to another one of the most famous uh, Judaic fathers, is uh, Moses. Uh, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about his wife, Zipporah, because it's very interesting that he has an African Ethiopian wife. The identity of the Ethiopian wo woman who Moses has married by the second year of the wilderness journey 
Now that's after the exodus. He gets married again. And they say, who is this Ethiopian woman that you've married, right? But some scholars here are basically saying, they assume that Zipporah and the Ethiopian woman are the same person. And that is the, the predominant belief, is that Moses, is, there's that only one wife, and that his wife was an Ethiopian. Um, okay, uh, many authorities who identify the Ethiop Ethiopian woman as Zipporah suggest that racial prejudice our simple woman-to-woman -woman jealousy provoked Miriam to question the authority of Moses and cite his marriage as her excuse. So, so they're just talking about why they made it seem like it was a bad thing for him to have married this woman. Because that's how the passage went. Um, okay, but different authorities cite different reasons for uh, identifying Zipporah as an Ethiopian. Usher states that the Mennonite country, that's what we talked about earlier, him leaving, uh, was part of Ethiopia at the time. Other authorities suggest that the Mennonites were not descended from Abraham at all, but from Ham. And see, this goes to what I was talking about. They're not acknowledging that he was Abram and became Abraham, but from Ham. But if he has changed to Ham, he can still be from him and still be related to Ham. This is my point. And so, and specifically Cush. So the idea is that there is something going on with Zipporah being an African woman. And then this is really, not only is she an African woman, but what does she do? She performs one of the only like graphic circumcisions ever described in the, in the, uh, in the Bible. Uh, okay, so at a lodging place on the way, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So this, this uh, is taking place at the time Moses goes to the land and is given the law on the mountain. And he's going back to Egypt to talk to the Pharaoh. And, 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 and on his way, the Lord met him and sought to put Moses to death. We don't know why. But then Zipporah, his Ethiopian wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin. Basically, she circumcised their son. And and threw the foreskin at the feet of Moses and said, surely you are the bridegroom of blood to me. So he, so he, God, let Moses alone. It's very mysterious. What did, what did that mean? Did Moses not circumcise his son, as was the law, and God was mad at him and going to kill him? And this woman, his wife, who, who we know is not part of the, you know, is the Midianite. But she takes it upon herself to circumcise the son. So there's some kind of knowledge that she has and a relationship with God that spares Moses' life. So, uh, so I'm going to move on now to another. And, and, uh, and, these, so, and if you notice, we're, these are three different people, three patriarchs of Judaism who are dealing with African women and African understanding. And so... This tale is partly retold in the Bible, uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, 1 through 13. So if you want to check it out, go check it out. Um, basically, the main story about this is King Solomon is, is known throughout the world for being very wise and, and a good king. Queen Sheba is very curious about him and wants to test his wisdom. But, but my point is, who is she to test his wisdom? He's, a, he's on the throne in Jerusalem, and she's going to test his wisdom. That means that she has some kind of a foreknowledge. There's something that's a mystery. But anyway, so she comes, but you got, not only does she come, she brings with her, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, where, where is it? She gave the king 120 talents of gold and space, spices of very great store, impressive stones. So she didn't just come to ask questions. She brought with her big wealth. And, uh, and there came no such abundance of spices as, the, as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. They hadn't seen that before ever. Not only that, but they brought gold and they brought algum trees. So she brought wood, these huge trees. But what did he do with them? The king made of the olive trees pillars for the house of the Lord. You know what that means. That's the tabernacle. So she used this wood that she brought from Ethiopia 
to, to build the tabernacle, to build the, sit, the holy of holies, the house of the Lord. For as for the king's house, harps, so they made all these things. And then at the end, king gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire. Whatever she has beside that to a sailor and gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went back to her country. And that's all we know in the Bible. But the Ethiopians, what they say is that when she came home, she was pregnant. And she, was, and she gave birth to Menelik, who became the first Ethiopian uh, king of old, who had direct lineage to King David and to Abraham and everyone else through Solomon. And that is the beginning of, of what the Coptic Christians today claim is their heritage to the Bible. And so, and I'm going to go into that more because here she is again. An Ethiopian queen present throughout antiquity. So it's very interesting because the queen of Sheba goes to goes to Solomon with this all this gold, all this stuff, then questioned him and was happy with, and then left. And so no one was converted. It was almost as though they understood each other already. You know what language were they speaking? Were they speaking the same language? So. The idea is that 900 years BCE, she's there talking to Queen uh, to uh, King uh, Solomon, and then in the New Testament, which is almost a thousand years later, we have the same thing happening. Now, according to some Bible scholars, they'll just say, "Well, that's they just took the Old Testament story and rewrote it and put it in the New Testament, and it never happened." They just took the old story and redid it and made it so that the same themes reoccur in the New Testament that occurred in the Old Testament. That's one theory. But if you just take it at face value, so at, in the year 38, 30 AD, uh, Peter it runs across, he, he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, this is quoted out of the Bible, Acts 8, chapter 8, uh, uh, who had the charge of all her treasury had come to Jerusalem to worship. Well, no, they say the ark, uh, according to them, they say the ark was moved from Jerusalem and taken to Ethiopia. Yeah, and, that, and that's part of the Menelik, Menelik story and the Queen of Sheba story is that, is that he went back and took it and took it to Ethiopia. But these are all myths that can't be, at, you know, there's no written uh, those are mostly oral traditions. In the Kabranic In the in the Kabranic Okay, and that's the Ethiopian text, right? So we when they and they do have Ethiopian texts that aren't recognized in the West. So that like the Catholic Church, they have Christian books that the Ethiopia recognizes that the Catholic Church does not recognize. But so I just had two pictures of, of, of practicing Jew, Jewish people from Ethiopia. Okay, um, uh, unique among African countries, the ancient Ethiopian monarchy maintains its freedom from colonial rule with the exception of a short-lived Italian occupation from 1936 to 1941. Uh, in 1974, a military junta disposed uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, who had been there for 40 years. He had been there since 1930. Um, uh, torn by bloody calls, okay, blah, blah, blah. So basically, this is just telling the, the history of modern Ethiopia. And uh, they've really had a lot of problems. So in 74, when the military junta came in, uh, a lot of the Jewish people, and they were very poor, and, and uh, they began to, be, to get persecuted more under the military junta. And, and uh, it was during this time, 1975, that Israel became uh, like officially became interested in bringing in the Falasha Jews from Ethiopia. But it's very interesting uh, to note uh, during my research that uh, uh, German Jews and Jews from Austria and Jews from Jerusalem and Palestine, uh, British mandate Palestine in early uh, 20th centuries, they all recognized better Israel. They all understood that, that there were Jewish people in Ethiopia even from the 1850s. So by the, from the 1850s onwards, there had been contact between Europe, the Ashkenazim, and, and Beta Israel. And so 
the knowledge of these two people existed for almost a hundred years prior to the, the first uh, operation to uh, bring the African Jews into Israel on a humanitarian basis. And uh, so this is where I'm going to talk about now. So Ethiopia is the oldest independent country in Africa, it means that it was never colonized our, our, uh, by a European country, except for that one period when Italy invaded. And, uh, and we don't, uh, I, I, this is kind of an aside, but when Italy invaded, the atrocities that took place there are, are hardly rarely talked about. They used chemical warfare, and they, and they depleted the, 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 the countryside of vegetation through chemical warfare. And, and, and to this day, Ethiopia is suffering from the chemical warfare that the Italians used out there in, in that four-year period. So um, it was very uh, densely populated country, 93 million people in the country. And, um, and this, and this is, and it's 13th largest in the world as far as uh, population density. Okay, now I'm going to get into uh, Israel's uh, modern relationship with Ethiopia. See, so after taking office in 1977, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, Begin uh, was eager to facilitate the rescue of Ethiopia's Jews. You know, and so they went into a period of selling arms to the Miriam government, which was the, the government that disposed uh, Haile Selassie, and they were Marxists, they were communists. And so it was kind of a, a weird thing for them to be selling them weapons. But they were doing it in order to get their trust and confidence. And so, uh, and so in hopes that oh, Ethiopia would allow the Jews to leave. In 1977, he asked the president, Magist Magistu, to allow 200 Ethiopians to, uh, to leave. And that was the beginning of the first exodus out of Israel. Uh, on November uh, 84, uh, Operation Mo uh, Moses began, and six weeks later it ended. And at that point, 7,000 Jews were rescued. And that was the most, the very first one that people really made the news. They're like, wow, Israel's, you know, taking these African, ancient African Jews and bringing them there as a rescue humanitarian mission. Um, and then, uh, in between Operation Moses and Operation Solomon, there was a CIA ran operation called Operation Joshua. And that was led by the first President Bush, actually. And during that, he, they brought in an extra 2,000 uh, 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 Jews. But that was the CIA actually did that one. And so, and then the next one, and the biggest one, was Operation Solomon, named for the, oops, uh, okay. Operation Solomon, named for the king, for whom one of the theories suggests that the better Israel drew their lineage, like we talked about. It said it almost it, uh, ended almost as quickly as it began, began, uh, but because there was still war going on in Ethiopia, and, and so it was hard to do the logistics. But during that time, a total of fourteen thousands were rescued and resettled. You know, and it was the modern, the, uh, a, a modern exodus of the grandest design. Uh, basically, it doubled the number of Jews who were saved during Operation Moses and Joshua. That's what it mentioned, Joshua. Um, and then this is just a plane from uh, a picture of, you know, they, they were just getting them on the C-130s and, and take them over there. Because what happened is that when the, when the government was fighting these wars and, and, and the philosopher heard that Israel was accepting people, people picked up from their huts and started walking to the nearest city trying to get to Israel. And so you ended up having you know, thousands and thousands of people at the Addis Ababa airport, and it was a humanitarian problem, actually. And because these people were completely poor, they might have the Torah, they had have the clothes on their back. And so it was truly it was a humanitarian effort also. And so as you see, they were just put on there and brought to Israel, and, and that's the beginning of their life in Israel. Okay. Um, and this is the, the part I'm going to end with, uh, uh, because, so, the Falasha, basically, who represented that hundred, that 20,000 initial Jews that Israel brought over, were Falasha Jews. And the Falasha Jews are the ones that you can go to Ethiopia at the time, you can go to the compound and see the Torah, 
you can see their rituals. You can see that they were practicing Jude Judaic law. But, and, but most, some of the law that they were practicing was archaic. And that's how they know that it was, they would have been this way for a long time because the Jews in Jerusalem don't even do it anymore. You know what I'm saying? So, so you have a lot of these archaic nomadic people who are, who are practicing the Judaic uh, religion, but only about 20,000 of them officially. But then this is what happened after that. Uh, Ethiopian of Philoshimora. So what ended up happening is that when those 20,000 were taken in Operation Solomon, they had cousins, they had, you know, distant relatives, and they had people who, in their family who were Christian, who were practicing Christian, but they were the brother of, the, of two people who went to Israel. But because their family somehow had converted to Christianity maybe a generation or two before because the whole nation was Christian, that what happens is that I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, so what happened is that you had, after the initial uh, operation took place, you had a bunch of these, the Falasha Mora, who were tribally the same people as the Falasha. They were the same people. But religiously, they had they had they had switched religions, and 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 so you had people come and say, "Well, we are Jewish, and our personhood, and we were persecuted and forced into begin, being Christian." That's basically what they were saying: is that yeah, our whole our, this is a Christian nation, but you know, a hundred years ago we were all Jewish, and so they were saying because we were all Jewish a hundred years ago, and we were forcibly. Uh, converted to Christianity, we want to go to Israel too. Because we are basically the same people as the Falasha. And so initially what happened is that they, they, they did take that into account and they brought in about, shoot, it sounded like almost 100,000. So there's more, way more Falasha Mora than there are Falasha. Way more. And so they did bring them in initially, but then this is what this talks about. As the number of Falashamora and Addis Ababa grew because they kept going to the capital, like, oh, we're going to get out of here and go to Israel because it's, it was starvation going on and Ethiopia was wiped out. So uh, the Israeli position hardened, which was at first we, we kind of, yeah, you guys were Jews and you got, you changed to Christianity. We'll let you back in so you can reconvert and learn your way again and be, come back to the family. But then after a while, when these people kept coming, kept coming, the Israeli position hardened. The official view was that these people were not Jews, and that they had, if they had ever been Jews, it was in the distant past. Uh, mo most now are practicing Christians who simply wanted to get out of Ethiopia by any means possible, saw opportunity to escape by claiming they were Jewish, uh, and thereby earning them the right to immigrate to Israel. The Israelis were convinced this motivation would encourage tens of thousands, perhaps most of the Ethiopian population, to claim. Jewish heritage. The, the Israeli government simply was not going to absorb it, you see. But in principle, they had already admitted that these people were Jewish in some sense. Now, and this, and this goes back to the whole idea we were talking about before, what is Judaism? Is it a religion? Is it a race? Is it a language? If you were to take it to be that it is a race, it's a gene pool, then you would have to include these people, even though they had converted to Christianity. If it's just a religion and they convert it, then they have lost their religion, they have changed. But coming from the idea of DNA, that's what they were talking about. The fact is, is that this nation of Israel has about 6 million people in the whole population. We already know how many people were in the nation of Ethiopia. So for them to absorb the whole nation of Ethiopia, it was impossible. Because there's 10 times as many people in Ethiopia as in all of Ethiopia, you know. But the, but the fact remains. So that if we were to say, okay, you all are Ethiopian Jews, that would increase the, the Jewish population of the world two or threefold. So anyway, a very interesting uh, point there. And so as we are now, um, the Falashamora are, are still in Ethiopia. Uh, the majority of people to this day, Ethiopia is 43% uh, uh, Orthodox Christian. 
another 30% Muslim, uh, and then they have uh, African indigenous nations. And at this point, they say there's zero Jewish people left in Ethiopia. I don't know if that's true or not, but that is what they say. Um, but, uh, and today, uh, uh, Israel is made up of multi-national uh, people from all over the world who, who come to Israel to practice their faith and to become part of the Israeli nation. And so, um, and like I said, I mentioned earlier, the black Hebrew Israelites are from the United States. And, and they migrated there during the 60s, during the civil rights era. But they defined themselves as black Jews and wanted to go to Ethiopia, uh, go to Israel. And they did. And so they're there, um, like you said, um, in Africa itself, South Africa is the most prominent uh, nation, has the most Jewish people in it uh, to this day. And so uh, Ethiopia, uh, Egypt, um, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the United States and Israel, those are the four most populated uh, countries with Judaic people in them, especially the United States. The United States uh, has by far the largest amount of, of Jewish people. And so that is the end of my uh, presentation. Um, I, I, I really didn't want to get into any of the actual religious aspects of Judaism because I'm not a scholar. And I just wanted to touch on the, uh, the, the relationship between black Africa and Judaism. I hope you all uh, were able to get something out of this. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm willing to answer them now. <laughs> Any questions at all? Will you be presenting this again? Um, I, I don't have any uh, plans to present this again, but I, we do have the PowerPoint on, uh, on file. We're going to be recording it today, so we may uh, have a, play this recording here again sometime, and then we can uh, talk about it and whatnot. And uh, we can stop the tape and, and break it apart like that or something. So uh, I hope you all enjoyed the thing, and I'd like to thank the JSU for putting this on, and uh, I look forward to collaborating more with you in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And the Jewish Student Union meeting is on Thursdays at 1 in the, uh, the room 212. All right. So thanks a lot. Okay.